What I'm going to talk to you about today is not rocket science. In fact, I think those rocket scientists have it easy. The um, basic laws of motion and gravitation were worked out by Newton in the 17th century. And if there's an equivalent of Newton in my field of study, I argue it's Linus Pauling, who's been dead less than 20 years. Now, I don't really want to run down rocket science. What I want to do instead is convey some of the excitement of working in a field where there are many fundamental things still to be worked out. Questions like, what's sleep really for? Is death inevitable? You might have ready answers for those, but scientifically we haven't gotten to the bottom of them. And what I'm going to talk about today, how does a human cell remember, is a question of that order, I think. And we're starting to, uh, to see how it works. And it's really fantastic to be contributing in my small way to uh, our developing understanding of that. And I'm showing you this um, guy here um, to illustrate some examples of what it is a cell really has to remember. In a way, it's a question of time scale. So over geological time, what we are as a species, what has worked for our ancestors, is stored in the DNA. But to thrive in a wide variety of environments, we also have to adapt within our lifetime to our environment. And so th these are things that a cell has to remember, what environment it's adapted to. So in this guy here, every muscle, every bit of muscle, it is adapted to how much exercise it gets, a lot in all this case. Every bit of skin adapts to how much sun it gets, also in this case a lot. So that's one thing that a cell has to remember. Another thing a cell has to remember is what its job is. So in this guy, there are cells completely dedicated to producing hair. There are other cells that maintain the structure of the bones. There are other cells devoted to providing a skin destined to rub off. And those job assignments are permanent unless something really bad happens like cancer or landing up in an experimental petri dish. So in thinking about these issues, Conrad Waddington back in the 1940s coined the term epigenetics to indicate that there was something above or beyond genetics that um, provided this memory. And he produced this fantastic figure which represents a landscape, a sloping landscape. And um, if you imagine a ball or a marble dropped at the top of the slope, its root down is constrained by which gully or ravine it's ended up in, and it can't easily get from one to the other. So that is a nice metaphor for the path a cell takes through development. And, um, and so the shape of the landscape is somehow the, uh, the memory of the cell. Now, in order to talk about this kind of memory, I have to go back and talk a bit about the genome. The genome is the uh, sum total of DNA in the cell and in our body. Each cell has the full DNA, even though it expresses only that part of it relevant to its job assignment. And when scientists try and popularize ideas of DNA, they often use the analogy of a book or a computer program, a piece of software. And neither of those analogies work in all that much detail for me. And I believe it's because they don't really convey the complexity 
of understanding what the DNA is. So as a book, as someone who's worked on DNA for many years, it's obvious that it's a great work, but it's unreadable. It's too chaotic. It's too hard to put the pieces together. And as a piece of software, it's just obvious they didn't use any reasonable programming practices. The analogy that works much better for me is the hard disk, and I hope it'll work for you as well, because everybody has at least a passing familiarity with computers. So, like DNA, a hard disk is a physical representation of data. Now imagine for a moment that the hard disk wasn't a routine item of commerce, but instead the invention of a foreign power or aliens. And you were given a disassembled hard disk like this to try to figure out what was in it, what information it represented. To do that, you would first have to figure out what it was about the disk that actually stored information. You'd have to invent some kind of technique or device to actually read off that pattern of magnetization on the surface. And then you would have to deduce somehow, you would have to find some way of deducing how the information was organized on the surface of the disk and encoded. And those things, even before you started to really understand, try to understand what the information was. So that to me feels a lot more like what genomics is than, uh, than does reading a book. So let's step back for a moment from this difficult job of reverse engineering from scratch and think about a hard disk in normal operation. What you need to make use of a hard disk is a computer with a specific operating system and some programs that are appropriate to whatever's on the disk. Those things, the operating system and programs, could be stored on the hard disk as well, but when they're actually in use operating the computer, they're read into memory, they're in the RAM. And so that's what's special in the case of a computer about whatever is currently being executed. And so that might be the kind of thing we're looking for in this memory of a cell. So uh, what kind of hard disk is it? Well, the human genome is about one and a half gigabytes. So it's not an impressively big hard disk. It's like something from the 1990s or maybe an inexpensive uh, thumb drive in current uh, money. On the other hand, it's tremendously well miniaturized. The hard disk that is the DNA and everything needed to run it, the computer, all fit in a human cell. And every one of us has about 10 trillion of them. So as a scientist, uh, I like to use many computers yoked together to get high performance computing. I personally am happy with something like this one, which has a few dozen computers. Uh, Google or other big brother type organizations might have thousands, but each of us has 10 trillion. So what's the DNA like physically? Well, it's a polymer. My clothes are also made out of polymers, and you can appreciate the stringy nature of DNA when you purify it in the lab. So here is some DNA dissolved in water being dried out by alcohol, and you can see many, many molecules of DNA um, clumping together to form something that looks like silk. And the DNA of a single human cell, if my arithmetic is right, end-to-end -end and stretched out is about a foot long. 
So you can imagine that there are certain practical problems if that amount of length, albeit unimaginably thin, is all stuffed willy-nilly into the cell nucleus. And uh, we've known for many years that it's not like that. It's actually packed in a very specific structure with a scaffold of proteins. In fact, if you take cells at the right level, at the right stage of cell growth and use the right staining and you're highly skilled, you can see the chromosomes, which are the structures that contain the DNA, in the light microscope and you can recognize them. So the human DNA is broken into 23 pieces. We have a copy from mom and a copy from dad of each one in each cell. And you can actually see in the microscope that each one has a specific consistent pattern of density in this specific kind of staining that you can actually use to recognize the chromosomes and whether they're intact and so on. And <coughs> it's not hard to imagine that such a specific complex structure must have a function. And we're starting to understand that in more and more detail. Um, and at the lowest level, the structure is that the DNA is wound around molecular bobbins made of protein. And those bobbins can be chemically modified in a way that varies how tightly they pack together. And that in turn uh, affects how accessible they are crudely speaking, for expression. And the DNA itself can also be chemically modified in a way that seems to reflect its current state of unpackedness and expression. This is um, a very crude statement of the way it is. But really it seems to reflect and stabilize the current state of expression of the DNA. And so you, you can think back to this epigenetic landscape and imagine that conceptually what makes up the walls of those gullies and ravines is the DNA methylation state. That's what guides the, uh, the cell through its path or keeps it in its current path. And we now have um, techniques that allow us to take small samples of tissue like blood or um, skin or fat or anything else from a number of people, prepare DNA from it, and reasonably inexpensively determine the state of DNA methylation at about half a million specific sites along the DNA. So some of those sites we know in quite a bit of detail, how they work, how they influence gene expressions, other, other ones not at all. But having that piece of data of half a million sites gives us a kind of sketch of this epigenetic landscape. And we can start to com compare those landscapes from people with different environments, at different ages, with different diseases. And using this, we can readily uh, determine in this example that's on the slide what the age of the person who donated the tissue was. We can also readily tell what kind of cells from the person the DNA is from. And in one um, example of an environmental exposure, you can also tell whether they smoke or not. So we're starting to be able to read this molecular uh, cellular memory. It's like we're starting to get the text files off that alien hard drive, except it's um, us. And that's just fantastic, I think. 
Thank you very much.